I think that brings us to sort of uh, Q and A. So um, we we want to hear your favorite Pokemon music and why. What what is it that makes it touch you? I thought we saw someone. All right. Yes. Uh, what's your name? And uh, Avery. Avery. Okay. What do you got there? Um, so I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting when you guys were talking earlier about how the um, a lot of the English renditions seem to be more of like the pop singers, but then they also have like the, the pop single that's meant to be like on the charts or whatever. Mm. It kind of reminds me of like how you see like Disney movies these days. Oh yeah. Like they always have like you know that like the movie version of like Let It Go or something, and then you have like I think it's Selena Gomez with somebody singing like the pop version that is meant to be like right the. And I don't know if that has something to do with like American culture or like if that's where they're getting it from or how far back that goes or like they tend to do that. No, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but you're right. Like Disney movies do that a lot too. And I wonder if it is that same mindset of like, you know, the voice actress is going to sing the one for the movie and that's going to be the movie, but we can also chart really high on the singles if we get Demi Lovato. That's, yeah, no, I think in Japan maybe has a similar mindset in that sense. I hadn't thought about it until you brought it up, but it's basically the same thing. <laughs> well, well, speaking of Disney movies, yeah, I mean, going back to Mulan, of course, that was uh, the the in, I forget who did this, it wasn't Ming-Na Wen, she did the voice of Mulan, but not the singing voice, but then of was course... Was it Leah Salonga? I honestly don't remember yeah, off. Someone knows, someone knows. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, Christina Aguilera, speaking of We Are a Miracle, did the, the pop version that really launched her career. Um, and actually, some of the same folks worked on We Are a Miracle, so there's some definite connections there. That may have, may have gotten the We Are a Miracle a few plays on Radio Disney. That, and there's some other Disney connections on the first movie soundtrack um, that we can maybe go into later. But yeah, that is sort of a, a thing there. I don't know that I would want... All due respect to Veronica Taylor, I don't know if I'd want her to try and sing We're a Miracle or The Power of One. You didn't love the Christmas bash. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's, an okay, it's an okay album, but I don't, I, it's certainly not top of my list. When I ran the station, I was a little bit, you know, not, not totally hate on it, but kind of glad that I only had to play it like about a month out of the year. Um, oh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so uh, other questions, observations, yeah. comments, anything Favorite like that. Songs. Or if you want to contrast Pokemon to other anime or stuff like that, uh, any questions like that, uh, feel free to ask that. Otherwise, we can talk a little bit more. Uh, we have another oh, 15, 20 minutes or so in our time range here. But we, we don't often get to talk to people about mm -hmm. Pokemon music, so, like, really, speak up. Tell us your favorites, your the things you favorite Pokemon movie if you, music is not coming to mind. Yeah, I mean, um, well, actually, here's a good question. What's your favorite Pokemon music as an over, or Pokemon movie as an overall musical package? Uh, mine is 2000. Um, I just love the score to that one. It's probably, one, it's definitely one of my top favorite movie scores of all time. I mean, yeah, my favorite is still the first movie. Yeah. I remember being like 10 and like sobbing my eyes out to that song when they're all like frozen inside. I know! Uh, no, that's a good one. Yeah, I, yeah, the English score of that movie like just hits you in the heart. <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a really good opportunity three or four years ago to interview uh, Ralph Shuckett, who did the uh, the dub scores for the first three Pokemon movies, and we go into a lot of detail on there about uh, sort of what his direction was and sort of what the process was. And he, he talks about some of the, the sacrifices they had to make. They couldn't do a, a real orchestra for the whole thing because a money and b time, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, he talked about how, how he worked with Norman Grossfeld. He provided a lot of the direction of what he wanted in terms of like overall stuff there. I, I admit the, the first movie is also one of my favorite movie scores of all time. Um, Tears of Life, really good. Uh, three on Three is sort of my other favorite uh, score element from there. And things, things like that. What about the vocal songs from the first movie? Like I said, that was a, that was a two million seller. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? I can try to answer uh, about those as I've done a lot of research over the years. But any, any, yeah. any questions? Want to try and stump me? Uh, we were just looking at the chat list. That was amazing. I was like, what? Britney Spears and NSYNC? I know. I know. My 90s soul is set afire. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. The Britney Spears, the only reason I can think of they, they picked that song, not that it's a horrible song, but it is an, Soda Pop is an item in the games. <laughs> I don't know if they were thinking that hard, but it does fit. 
Just think, if they had kept doing that, would we have gotten Beyonce's Lemonade years later? Yes! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I do really wonder what they're going to do with the Detective Pikachu movie, because that's going to be a a big production. We're going to see a level of promotion we haven't seen since, like, probably 2000. Uh, Probably since that, where it went all out. Three was wide release, but not as big. Uh, but I really wonder like, what kind of score they're going to use, whether they're going to have insert songs, if they are, who's going to write, if there's going to be a big ending theme over the credits and stuff like that. Uh, that'll be an interesting thing to, to find out there. So I'm really interested in that because they're obviously going to have a bigger budget there for music and things like that. So we'll see. Um, really interested in that. Uh, but yeah, NSYNC, I, I did get a chance actually mm-hmm. last year to do a written interview with uh, Mark uh, Muller who co-wrote that song. Uh, he, it was originally written for a woman by the name of Jennifer Page. Her big song is Crush. You know, it's just a little crush, that one. But she also did the original version of that. Uh, interesting thing, Mark Muller, kind of a thing from my childhood, he actually wrote the theme song, speaking of Disney, for <coughs> DuckTales and Rescue Rangers. I do kind of think Somewhere Someday sounds kind of like a little bit like a slowed down version of the DuckTales theme. There's a little bit of that in there. Um, but that was fun to learn some of that, that stuff out there. He actually played a bit of a role in getting it on the soundtrack because uh, NSYNC was in a weird spot there because they were switching between producers and stuff like that. And uh, they somehow managed to get that. So it's kind of a miracle that song even made it on the soundtrack because there was like some red tape involved and things like that. Um, for, for you just walking in, we're talking about our favorite Pokemon Uh, music, favorite Pokemon movies, so if you have something you just want to share, like, I love X because blah, feel free to stick your hand up. (laughs) Yeah, we do kind of want to hear that. Um, Let's see, some other things you might not know. Um, On the first movie soundtrack, remember the song, uh, Making My Way Any Way That I Can? You know, that one, the the Billy Piper. So yeah, if you need to play Six Degrees with uh, Pokemon and Doctor Who, that's how you get there. But there's like three or four different, at least, other versions of that song. There's like a a version originally by Winona Judd, uh, which is on the soundtrack to a movie called The Associate. Um, There's also a version, let's see, Marsha Hines. There was a version, an ensemble version that was used in the MTV reality series Faking the Video. Um, All very different arrangements, and that's another fun thing we get to do in in this series is I would say check some of those out. You might not like them as much as the Billy Piper one was the one to use for this movie. Um, and it, it works so well because I think, in part because, you know, you said, if the river's too wide, I'll get through it. If the mountain's too high, and, you know, maybe that's a, uh, a reference nod to that other song uh, from back in the 70s or whatever. Uh, but uh, um, it, it works well because those were figurative originally when that was written, I'm sure. But in, in, in Pokemon, those are things you literally do in the games. You have to cross rivers and climb mountains and stuff like that. So that makes that a, a really interesting choice. Uh, it was written, I think, let's see, by Diane Warren, a uh, very prominent songwriter. I don't remember. She's been nominated for, like, Best Original Song at the Oscars nine times, including this last year. I think she might have lost again, unfortunately. <laughs> so get it one of these years. Outside of lyrical tracks, I was really impressed. How many of you saw the Victini, a Victini movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the two different scores completely, and two different composers scoring each film. I thought that was really impressive. And I think, in my heart, I lean a little more towards white. But then I watch black, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's good too. Does anyone ha- have any strong opinions about that movie? Because I'm interested to see if we have to split this like a wedding or. <laughs> Nah. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an interesting study. I saw, well, I think I saw, must have seen Pokemon the movie White first, because I saw it, and they did a limited theatrical digital run. For that. That's one of the nice things. You know, back when they did the limited stuff for the fourth and fifth movies, much harder because they were still using film. They had to print that out. Mm-hmm. You had to switch between cities every couple of weeks. So, but now with the digital stuff, they can, you know, just put a bunch of hard drives out there and stuff like that. So I do, I do like that, but I did see, going back to the movie, I did see White first, uh, Zekrom. Uh, mm-hmm. I saw that one first before I saw the, the Reshiram one. I'm not sure I had a huge opinion on the scores, even though I have listened to those. Yeah, well, neither of them really have a piece of music that's like, kagam. It's just like the idea of that musical project of like, this is going to be a completely separate thing, and then together they make the whole. Like, I'm still... 
oh, what an idea. <laughs> well, in the, I know in the white movie, there's actually like a score theme that comes back a couple times that I think it just maybe sticks because it seems vaguely reminiscent of Zelda's Lullaby from the Legend of Zelda series. <laughs> so you got the, uh, a few notes that are in common there. Anyone else have a deja vu moment listening to it, really any anime song or stuff like that? I would throw that one out there. I think I'll, I'll bring up, we talked about briefly about In Excess earlier. I, I see I have, you thinking. <laughs> yeah, but um, one of the ones uh, I really like is, um, on the Japanese side, is, is this ending theme from the fourth generation called Kaze no Message or Message of the Wind. Oh, yeah. And I have this sneaking suspicion. I looked up some of the details about, like, the guy who wrote it was born in the early 70s, so in the late 80s. I know In Excess does have some Japanese fan base. He would have been about the right age when they hit their, their peak there in the late 80s. But um, it, if it had a saxophone, I'd be willing to call it a, a, a ripoff. But... <laughs> um, just weird stuff like that sometimes. I think going back to Hip Tanaka, he likes to sample like Beatles stuff. I think there is one of the, the early Pokemon stuff samples I am the Walrus or something like that has a, a similar line there. Um, but yeah, that, that's. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I got a question for you guys. So the last Pokemon I've seen was uh, Hoopa and the, oh, the, yeah. the Hoopa one. Mm hmm. And there was not a single song that stuck out to me. It was all just kind of bland. I are, guess. Are you, are you talking about now? Are you talking about the ending theme songs or the score? Because it's all of it. And, and Okay, now the score, this is starting with the uh, X and Y movies. They started, they went back to using a, a unique uh, English score. Are you talking about the Japanese score or the English score for that? English. Okay. And that kind of gets to my question was, do you think throughout the years they kind of stopped putting as much effort into not just the musicality of the movies, but the movies themselves, or is it just a nostalgia filter both over the movie and the song? Well, I actually I have an opinion, but if you want to take it first. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think this might be the last question we have to wrap up on, but thank you very much. So actually, I kind of have the reverse opinion. So the last few movies, starting with the uh, Diancy movie in Gen 6, have all been scored uh, primarily by a man by the name of, oh gosh, I did a written interview with him. I can see his face, <laughs> and I cannot remember his name off the top of my head. Oh, this is embarrassing. Um, it'll come to me right after this panel ends. But anyway, the guy they hired who replaced sort of the, the John Leffler crew from the fourth and fifth generations. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the guy. It's, it's bugging me all the time. Um, I can, like I said, I can see his face. But anyway, they brought him in, uh, he, and now he does scores for the, the movies as well. They usually keep some of the game themes. I actually kind of like what his work is, is more, and that's getting back to the subjectivity. I can see how some people would prefer like the Shinji Miyazaki stuff, because he did, um, he worked in some manner, well, on all the Japanese movies except for 10, where they brought in the guest composers right. on that side. Um, but they, uh, I kind of prefer, I, after movie 10 with Arasio, and I think Shinji Miyazaki's work yeah. is, isn't awful or ear piercing or anything like that, but there's been very little that's made me say, that was really good, or anything like that, kind of, unfortunately. Um, Ed Goldfarb, that's the name. <laughs> uh, yeah. The person who does the, most of the music stuff nowadays in the, in the dub, so. Uh, in, in my opinion, I really do think there is an A team and a B team with the Pokemon movies, and like they kind of seem to alternate years. And when you look at the staff, it kind of seems to reflect that you've got this team working on the, the movie this year, and then a lot of different people, and then a little bit of crossover. So I really, and you know, the one team seems to produce stronger movies, and the other team slightly less stronger movies. And so I do think that sometimes, yeah, I, the B movie, of the year is not as solid and I, I also agree with you like some of the earlier Pokemon movies that Shinji Miyazaki did a lot more variety in tone and instrumentation and in themes and things and whereas some of the later ones are a little bit more generic and bland so I think I do see what you're saying yeah I, I don't know that it's necessarily a lack of effort as like when they brought in the new people to do the two Victini scores, you heard a marked difference of, this is different than like the past five Pokemon movies where you almost could have just swapped out the score and it probably wouldn't change. So I don't know if it's less a lack of effort as much as, you know, maybe they need to just switch a few people up. 
And I think maybe sometimes you get into doing a way of things and the B team gets you know, good at their job and the A team gets good at their job and maybe if we just switch the team up a little, we'd have some fresh ideas. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so that's, I think we're gonna do it. We're getting a little bit uh, the signal here, but. Oh, sorry. That's okay, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate that. We can talk afterwards if you have some more questions or thank comments. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you very much.